Do you know the difference between celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and IBS? Today, we're talking the facts. Hey guys, my name's Andrea Hardy. I'm a registered dietitian and owner of Ignite Nutrition Inc. here in Calgary, Alberta. Today, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the difference between celiac, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and IBS particularly in regards to a paper that just came out. Now, this paper was really well done. However, I think without looking at it through the lens of science, um, I think there's left a lot of room for interpretation and perhaps incorrect interpretation of what the paper was trying to achieve. So today I wanted to go through with you the differences in these things and really explain to you what each of the different conditions are to the level that we know about them. So first off is celiac disease. Now I'm sure many of you have heard of celiac disease before. Uh, it's an autoimmune condition where when people ingest gluten, they have an immune response in their small intestines causing damage to their villi and oftentimes have unusual GI symptoms, uh, may have some neurological symptoms, pain, achy joints, um, have issues with maintaining their nutrition, things like iron, calcium, uh, folate, fiber, all of that, um, and also uh, may develop um, rashes depending on um, depending on how their diagnosis presents. Now, many people can go a very long time without getting celiac disease diagnosed. Um, it's estimated, oh gosh, how many Canadians? I forget off the top of my head, um, but I, I, I can't remember the stat, but there's a lot of people walking around um, who have not been diagnosed with celiac disease who have it. And that is because not everybody presents with the severity of what you might typically think with celiac disease, or maybe they've been misdiagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, maybe they've cut out gluten on their own and haven't actually received the proper testing for celiac disease. Uh, there's a variety of different reasons why people may be missed in terms of diagnosis. So my first most important message when it comes to today's talk is do not cut out gluten without seeing your family doctor first. I repeat, do not cut out gluten without seeing your family doctor first. If you're exhibiting gut symptoms, if you're not feeling well, if you're having chronic diarrhea, unexplained weight loss, some people don't lose weight uh, with celiac, um, but um, maybe having GI issues, um, do not cut out gluten as a first line response. And I think in the media, a lot of people are um, wanting to cut out gluten uh, because it's uh, very trendy right now. However, when you do that, it makes diagnosis extremely hard. Um, so you need to have ingested gluten to have um, the antibodies floating around your blood. So first they would do the blood test. And uh, then from there, they decide if they'd like to proceed with the biopsy, other options, um, can be uh, through genetic testing. Usually biopsy is um, what we're seeing mostly in Canada. However, I do know other places are looking at um, the blood test plus genetic markers for celiac disease as a pro uh, possible way to diagnose. So um, to have those antibodies floating around or to test positive on a biopsy, the damage has to currently exist in your gut. And so making sure you don't cut out gluten so that you get the right diagnosis is key because ultimately we see people self-diagnosing themselves with celiac disease or gluten intolerance. They cut out gluten and then we don't know, are you non-celiac gluten sensitivity? Are you um, just your traditional uh, IBS? Or do you have an autoimmune condition where we really do need to be not only concerned about the ingestion of gluten um, from a you know wheat, barley, rye perspective, but also from a cross-contamination perspective, um, from other things you may ingest orally. Uh, we do want to be very aware of that and people with celiac disease need to adhere to a lifelong gluten-free diet and very carefully oftentimes watch um, their accidental exposure to gluten. So um, celiac disease, I think we have a good understanding of. Um, and of course, IBS, I talk about it all the time, irritable bowel syndrome um, is not a diagnosis of exclusion. It has specific diagnostic 
criteria. I'm not going to get in it today, but I have tons of videos. I will attach them in the comments. Um, but it does have very specific diagnostic criteria as long as all the red flags are ruled out. So unintentional weight loss, blood in your stool, clay colored, pasty colored stools um, would be things that we'd want to rule out before moving down the diagnostic pathway for IBS. Celiac disease, duh, um, those sorts of things. So I'm not going to get too much into IBS, but what I really wanted to touch on today was non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Now, non-celiac gluten sensitivity is not believed to be an autoimmune condition. It appears to be um, a reaction to gluten that is similar in presentation to celiac disease, so digestive issues alongside maybe some of those neurological type issues like foggy brain, headache, achy joints. However, um, they are negative for the antibodies for celiac disease and their biopsies are clear. There's no damage to their GI tract. So we've been seeing this phenomenon. However, we aren't sure the best way to diagnose it because we don't fully understand the diagnostic criteria um, as well we're not 100% sure what the level in which we need to avoid wheat is. So do we need to completely avoid wheat in a similar way to celiac disease where we have to watch um, cross-contamination or is it um, more of a dosing effect? So watching the total amount of wheat. And so um, this new paper is starting to explore um, what non-celiac gluten sensitivity is and how we can go about better understanding it. And so, um, you know, we're wondering whether it's a non-IgE allergy. So a traditional allergy that when you think of when you think of anaphylaxis is an IgE allergy. So you think of like a traditional peanut allergy um, or a wheat allergy, which can be diagnosed with um, skin prick testing by an allergist. A non-IgE mediated allergy um, is often more of a GI presentation and it is um, not activated by the IgE pathway, but rather uh, mast cells, eosinophils, um, or other immune cells. And so we typically see this more in kids, especially with milk, soy, um, wheat potentially, um, but we don't often see it in adults or perhaps we've missed it in adults, which may be why people end up with non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, maybe it was something that was um, underdiagnosed in as a child. Um, the other thing is, is um, if it's not an, a non-IgE allergy, is it a reaction to um, you know, something in the wheat. So they're postulating that it may not be the gluten that's causing this unusual reaction of non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, so other plausible um, uh, components of wheat that may be playing a role is the lipopolysaccharides, which are um, known as pro-inflammatory compounds um, to the um, intestinal lining. Um, amylase trypsin inhibitors, we've um, associated that with um, a baker's allergy. So people that inhale a lot of wheat get that asthmatic um, reaction. Um, Anti-glutenin or perhaps FODMAPs. So talk about FODMAPs a lot. Again, I'll attach something below if you don't know what FODMAPs are. Um, so there was a really great small scale study in which they took 36 IBS patients and um, under endoscopy, so a patient being put out, so fairly invasive, camera down the esophagus um, to the duo duodenum, which is part of your, the first part of your small intestine. They administered a wheat suspension and used some really great new technology to assess what happened immediately to the intestinal lining. And they saw in 13 out of the 36 IBS patients, so that's a fairly big amount, um, almost half, they saw increased lymphocytes, which is a sign of an immune reaction, um, increased epithelial sh shedding, so damage to the cells, um, maybe not in the similar way to what we'd see in celiac, but you know, some epithelial sh shedding there, and then increased gastrointestinal permeability. Um, so that means that I don't do math very well in my head. 19 of the patients did not have a reaction, had true, you know, pro probable IBS diagnosis. 
whereas 13 of the 36 actually had this unusual um, non-IgE mediated immune response to the wheat suspension. And so this leads us into um, better understanding how we can potentially diagnose non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And this was done um, clinically. It's definitely something that is extremely invasive and very unlikely to be done as like, you know, a workup test, um, at least not now, but it allows us to better understand the mechanisms behind non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And it's estimated that um, anywhere from 0.6 to almost 11% of the population may have this non-celiac gluten sensitivity that is poorly understood, um, but we're looking to uh, better understand what is going on there. So from a practical perspective, what does this mean for my patients? Now, I believe that I've come across non-celiac gluten sensitivity just a handful of times in my practice. Um, I'd say, you know, it's difficult to say because we don't have the diagnostic picture. However, through the low FODMAP diet, we do cut out um, larger portions of wheat, barley, rye, those um, gluten containing grains. Is it the gluten or is it something else in wheat? We don't quite know yet. However, through cutting those out and then reintroducing them properly as part of the low FODMAP uh, protocol, um, I've had some patients have some very unusual reactions to wheat beyond what I would typically expect of my IBS patients, and they exclusively reacted to wheat. So they tolerated the other fructans like onions and garlic. However, their wheat reaction was very unusual. Um, I've had patients be, you know, negative for celiac um, on blood tests and biopsy, and then have nausea, have, you know, joint pain, have um, diarrhea. I had a couple of patients have some vomiting episodes. So um, their reaction to wheat was really unusual. And I mean, obviously, we don't have diagnostic criteria for non-celiac gluten sensitivity. However, um, the person ended up um, adhering to a lifelong um, wheat-free diet. Or so I assume that's what she's doing. Or um, I had a male patient similar presentation, uh, assume that's what he's doing. Um, so ultimately, um, when it comes to practice, I think dietitians are going to play a big role in understanding your symptoms really strategically. You know, if it's an IBS diagnosis, approaching it from a FODMAP perspective um, first for moderate to severe IBS, and then considering, you know, could this be something that is going on um, if we don't get either adequate symptom management, if there's any sort of neurological complaints alongside uh, their IBS, um, and can we uh, test it out in a similar way to FODMAPs? There's no evidence to support that that's the best way to do it. However, it would make sense from a practical perspective until we better understand um, the non-celiac gluten sensitivity diagnosis and management. Um, so I just wanted to end on the fact that causation does not, or sorry, correlation does not mean causation. So what that means is, is if we correlate something, when somebody eats a gluten containing grain, they get sick. Um, we assume that gluten caused the symptoms, but in non-celiac gluten sensitivity, now we're wondering, is it the gluten? Um, so there's the correlation between these things, but that does not mean that that's what caused the non-celiac gluten sensitivity as we're calling it. Perhaps it's another component of wheat that we need to be aware of. Is it FODMAPs? Is it um, the amylase trypsin inhibitors? Is it um, the LPS, so the lipopolysaccharides? What is it that's causing the symptoms? Until we know the answers, I still encourage people to make sure that they're getting their IBS diagnosis, still seeing a dietitian to work with them on the most practical way to manage their IBS symptoms. And then dietitians, we can keep in our back pocket what we currently know about non-celiac gluten sensitivity and um, consider how we're going to um, work that into practice in a person who presents with what we uh, appear, what appears to be that like hypersensitive sensitivity to eat. Uh, lastly, again, do not cut out gluten without seeing your doctor first. We know that a gluten-free diet, like the low FODMAP diet, decreases the variety, the abundance of bacteria in your gut, so very likely um, impacting your gut health long-term in a negative way. Um, it decreases the amount of fiber you typically get in your diet, and it puts, puts you at risk of calcium deficiency, osteoporosis, 
um, from not consuming enough calcium as well as iron deficiency, anemia. Um, so making sure that you get enough nutrition because a lot of our gluten containing foods have those important nutrients in them. So um, make sure you have your diagnosis prior to playing around with um, removing wheat or gluten containing foods uh, and work with a dietitian who is experienced and can interpret the research in a way that um, is going to keep you safe and increase the variety in your diet long term. So that is my spiel on celiac versus non-celiac gluten sensitivity versus IBS. I'm interpreting a paper that was recently published that has, I think, um, caught a lot of media and dietitians' attention, and I just wanted to interpret it in a way that is very practical for you. Um, I don't think I'll have any questions today as it seems to be quite quiet, uh, but if you do, please shoot me an email admin at ignitenutrition.ca. I'm here every Monday at 9 a.m. MST. Next weekend's the long weekend, so I will not be here. Um, but I will answer any questions that you guys have um, on any sort of nutrition topic whatsoever. So I primarily talk about gut health, but I will talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. And I look forward to seeing you all after the long weekend, so two weekends from now on Monday. Have a great day. Bye.